All right, so good evening to everyone. I welcome you to tonight's presentation. My name is David. Our presentation today will be given by Clement Lupola from Chipata Central Hospital in Zambia. And the title of the presentation is The Cardiac Cycle. Our moderator is uh, Mr. Chitumba. So I'm now going to hand over the talk. I'll be changing the slides from my side and then Clement will do the talking. And once again, I kindly ask that people mute their microphones. If you're not Chitumba or David or Clement, kindly mute the microphone. Mr. Clement, the platform is all yours. All right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, Clement Lupumbaola. As I've been introduced already by David from Chipata Central Hospital. I wish to take you through the cardiac cycle uh, with background knowledge that we intend to be practicing basic echocardiography. And so I, we thought it wise that we, we take this journey from, from the onset. So our main objectives, you can go back to the objectives. Okay. David? Yes. Yes, um, yeah, there we are. Okay, that's okay. Our main objectives as we go along this discussion, we want to define what cardiac cycle is and basically look at um, the anatomy of the heart a little bit and then relate it uh, to the cycle phases. Of course, knowing that there are atrial events and ventricular events. After understanding that, we'll couple it with a few slides on pathologies that affect generally the heart muscles and those are the cardiomyopathies that we're going to see next. So in terms of definition, we can define the cardiac cycle Next, Mr. David, we can define the cardiac cycle as having one, okay, just there, it's okay. As having one systole and one diastole. Systole entails contraction of the heart and diastole means relaxation. Therefore, we are talking about one complete cycle that is having from one systole plus one diastole, meaning one contraction complete contraction and a complete relaxation. So basically the heart has got two functions then. It's got a diastolic function which allows ventricular filling. And then it's got a systolic function which then maintains the stroke volume or cardiac output in other words. So as we look at the heart, basically it is divided into two. If you want the right heart, if you may wish, and the left heart. Of course, each side of the heart having uh, two chambers, the atria and the ventricle, respectively, meaning the right the ventricle and the right atrium. The left ventricle and the right uh, the left uh, ventricle, sorry, and the left atrium. So those are the basic four chambers. And for the purposes of doing echocardiography in this discussion, I may be biased towards the left ventricle in that it's our main pump. It's the main pump that ejects blood, sending it to the systemic circulation. So from the onset, I want to be very clear that we need to understand that whatever events are happening in the right heart are equally happening in the left heart. The only difference thereof are pressure changes in these chambers that we look at. So that is basically the anatomy, the cable system being the superior vena cover, 
and the inferior vena cava dropping into the right atrium. Okay, then goes into the right ventricle. Those arrows you can simply relate. You've got uh, blood through the pulmonary circulation. Of course, you've got the atrioventricular valves there. And then the outflow tract, meaning pulmonary veins and then aortic outflow tract. So basically, in a nutshell, simple anatomy, we can look at that, uh, the atrioventricular septum there, okay, uh, uh, that borders between the two, the two ventricles. Of course, there are a number of diseases uh, that may, again, affect the nomenclature or the anatomy of, of the heart being congenital abnormalities. Uh, that discussion may be for another time, but basically, we want to look at these chambers in relation to uh, echocardiography. Next slide. Okay, as, as David is moving the next slide. As we are discussing um, the cardiac cycle, I want to be very particular about what we'll be concentrating on. As a matter of fact, I did mention that we'll be biased on certain times towards the left ventricle, it being the main pump. But we have to take care of three chambers as we discuss the cardiac cycle, meaning we're talking about the input chamber and we're also talking about the output chambers. So you're going to realize that having discussed the cardiac cycle being one systo and one diastole, we are going to begin our journey from the point where the atria it receives current, okay? It receives impulses for it to contract. Of course, having an, under, an understanding that most of the heart being the left ventricle feels about 80% passively, all right? So once the left heart has filled to about a capacity of 80%. The remainder of the 20% is the one now that is squeezed by virtue of the atria contracting. And remember that we're discussing both mechanical changes and pressure changes in our cycle that we have to understand. All right, so the atria contracts, squeezing 20% of the blood into the left ventricle. So the first phase that we're going to talk about is the atrial contraction. You can show me the next slide, Mr. David. Having a background that the left ventricle fills to capacity of about 80%, even before the atria contracts, okay? It simply means that clinically, even somebody who's had issues with their left atria in terms of pathology, the heart would probably continue functioning because we are having 80% of uh, our blood filling, of our left ventricle filling. So by definition, if you want to go by definition, that is the definition that uh, we had put across, that the cardiac events that are going to occur from the beginning of one heartbeat to the beginning of the next these are called the cardiac cycle. So it consists of a period of relaxation and contraction. Okay, that's by definition. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Now, we are focusing on the atria as a pump. Remember I said we are going to start the journey from the point where the atria now contracts. So at what point does the atria contract? We are saying, the atria will contract, squeezing 20% of the remainder of blood or to fill the left ventricle after the left ventricle has filled in a passive manner. Mm -hmm. So during left atrial contraction, there is communication of the left atria with the left ventricle in terms of blood that is squeezed into the left ventricle, the remainder that had remained. After which, Mm -hmm. after which the pressures that have been transmitted through the left atria into the left ventricle. We expect that if the left ventricle fills to capacity, 
the back valve, which is the atrioventricular valve, in this manner, the mitral valve closes. So always remember, in relation to the heart, we're talking about the, light, the, the left heart and the right heart. I did mention that I may be biased towards the left ventricle in my explanations, but always remember that whatever is happening on the right heart is equally happening on the left. Meaning that if the mitral valve are closing, we expect that the tricuspid valve also have closed. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so that um, is a schematic diagram that shows us at a point where the left atria contracts and is emptying blood into the left ventricle. So similarly, what is happening there, the right atria contracting and emptying blood into the right ventricle. So this is what I was explaining, that every event that is happening on the left side of the heart is equally happening on the right side of the heart. So we can see the atrioventricular valves being open, okay, blood ejecting into, into the ventricles. Okay, next slide. Now, since the, the, the ventricle has filled up and the, the atria has contracted and emptying blood into the left ventricle, we are going to realize that the pressures in the left ventricle begins to build up, okay? Once the pressures in the left ventricle begins to build up, the back valve, which is the mitral valve, has closed up already after that kick. And the pressures are not too high that they may open the outflow tract, which is the aortic root. The aorta is, the aortic valve is still closed. I did emphasize that we will be looking at three chambers, what is happening in the aorta, that's the first chamber, what is happening in the left atria, and what is happening in the left ventricle, okay? So we are concentrating on these three chambers, excuse me. So pressures at this time are not too high enough that the aorta can open. At this particular time, the left ventricle will be contracting as a closed chamber. I hope that one is clear. The left ventricle contracts as a closed chamber because pressures are not too high enough that they may open the aortic valve. So at this particular time, we're going to realize that having filled the ventricle already by the kick of the atria, the mitral valve closes. If you are a physician that is able to auscultate uh, is produced which is called s1 sorry about that there was a call coming okay you can give me the next slide mr david i'm explaining atrial contraction first then the ventricle has filled up the ventricle begins to contract but pressures are not too high enough that they may open the the chamber okay you can see the bullets there Let ventricle the pressures keep building up in the left ventricle so because blood is neither entering remember the back valve has been closed and the blood is neither leaving mm, during this period this next phase is now going to be called the isovolumetric contraction the heart is contracting remember so iso means equal volume these are volumes of blood metric that's pressure okay so they are equal uh, um there's an equal volume in that the back valve has been closed which is the atrioventricular valves and the aortic root is not yet open so the chamber is contracting as a closed chamber so this stage is called isovolumetric contraction Okay, uh, I hope we, we get that one. Left ventricle contracts as a closed chamber, like the last bullet is saying, as pressures are not too high. So that is uh, the, the picture that is shown. If you focus on the, on the valves there, the atrioventricular valves, they are closed. 
Okay, so blood is not going out. There, the atroventricular valves are closed at the beginning of this phase. So what I've been explaining are those uh, bullets there. Remember, we're talking about mechanical events that are happening and pressure changes that are continuously building up because the muscle is contracting, having received the uh, grants in there. So the duration has been given there at a, a, a 0.3 of a second of the time that it takes. Okay, we can, we can go to the next one. Okay, so when pressure in the left ventricle becomes more than the iota, okay, in that I mean more than 80 millimeters of mercury, we can notice that as we are taking our vitals, our blood pressure usually, usually ranges in the range of 120 millimeters of mercury. That is normal, okay? So these pressures, once they build up in the left ventricle, above 80 millimeters of mercury, the aortic root or aortic valve will open. Once the aortic valve opens up, the blood is rapidly or forcefully ejected. So that's the next phase then. That's rapid, period of rapid ejection. Okay, that's the heading there. Blood is forcefully ejected because of the pressure that had built in the left ventricle. So blood is ejected through the aorta, okay, into the systemic circulation. So we call this a period of rapid ventricular ejection or period of rapid ejection just because most of the pressure is built within the ventricle as it was contracting as a closed chamber had reached the maximum beyond that of uh, the aorta. So forcing the aortic valve to open. So if you can concentrate uh, on the schematic diagram there, you can see that red arrow showing us Okay, the outflow tract there where blood is being ejected either from the right ventricle, remember, and the left ventricle respectively. Like I said, that whatever event is happening on the right heart, it is equally happening on the left heart. So those arrows are showing you upwards, are showing you where the blood is being ejected. And if you concentrate on the, yeah, there, okay, the case I can put there, okay. Yeah, though that, that's that's the ejection phase, rapidly ejecting on the left heart, even on the right heart, the same because those green valves are open there. Then when you concentrate on the uh, atrioventricular valves, that's the mitral valve on the left and the tricuspid valve on the right, you can notice that they are closed there. Mm -hmm. mm, there is no blood uh, coming through into the left ventricle. Therefore, blood is just being eject ejected uh, into the outflow tract. That is the rapid uh, ventricular ejection phase, okay? Um, before I tackle that, you can, leave, you can leave that slide just there, it's okay. I also need to mention that since pressures are not sustained continuously at this stage of rapid ventricular ejection uh, phase, pressures begin to fall and they begin to drop. Blood continues to be ejected, but at a slow pace. Therefore, some other literature may term this as a slow ventricular ejection phase. Remember, we are coming from a rapid ventricular ejection phase. And now the next one will be slow ventricular ejection phase because the pressures are beginning to fall now. It's no longer 120 millimeters of mercury. So blood is still being ejected, but at a slow, a rather slow pace than the first one. Now, what usually happens is that when the aorta squeezes the last part of the blood uh, going to the systemic circulation, some back pressure uh, that tries to come back uh, dropping backwards will cause the aortic valve to close. You should mark that one. As the aorta, because that's a muscular uh, vessel. So as it is squeezing, some blood, as the uh, pressures are dropping, some blood may has got a tendency of trying to um, drop back. So this forces the aortic valve to snap up uh, and close. So the, the left ventricle is now beginning to relax at that time because remember, uh, pressures are now beginning to drop. So it ceases to contract and it is beginning to, to relax. 
Okay, this is the stage now that we are going to the isovolumic uh, relaxation. The ventricle now begins to relax. I must mention here quickly that at this particular time, the atria, eh, the atria are now working as a reservoir. You, you can go back to the previous slide a little bit. I show something, Mr. David. The atria are now working as a reservoir, not that one, backwards. One step. The atria, oh, yes, there, okay? We can see that the, the green valves there, the atrioventricular valves are closed, but we can still see red arrows into the, the atria, okay? On the right side from the cable system, that's the inferior vena cover on the, on, on the, the right side and the superior vena cover respectively, okay? Venous blood is still retaining into the atria. However, there is no communication between the atria and the ventricle. I hope we can mark that one. There is no communication. Therefore, the atria are still working as the atria are still working as a reservoir. Okay, we, I wanted to, to make a mention about that one now. Since the left ventricle is now beginning to relax because of a closed chamber, uh, because uh, it's beginning to relax because of reduced pressures, we are now going into a period of relaxation. So this is isovolumic relaxation. Do not confuse isovolumic contraction with isovolumic relaxation. At this particular time, the ventricle is now beginning to relax, okay? As much as the atria are also still working as a tank, the atria are still working as a reservoir. There is no communication. The ventricle is relaxing. Mm -hmm. So that's a period of isovolumic relaxation. That should not be confused with uh, isovolumic contraction. Okay, those are schematic uh, diagrams still showing the same um, uh, diagram that we had. And of course, pressure changes that are happening, not be confused. Uh, those are pressure changes in there. And uh, there is also, also an explanation uh, of uh, uh, the waves that are happening there. Now, as soon as pressures in the left ventricle becomes less than that in the atria, the mitral valve opens up. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that one. Pressures were still building there. The atria was still working as a tank or as a reservoir. As soon as pressure in the left ventricle becomes less, or rather if you are in the right ventricle becomes less than that in the atria, the mitral valve opens, that's on the left, and the tricuspid valve opens on the right. And all the blood, okay? You can go to the next slide, Mr. David. All the blood which had accumulated in the left atria will fall into the left ventricle. This is a period called rapid, but passive ventricular feeling. Why rapid? Because there was a lot of blood in the atria. It was acting up as a tank. So there will be a lot of blood passing through passively. Rapid, but passive ventricular phase. This is the phase that we're talking about because now the left um, atria has got the mitral valve opening and blood is oozing, falling into the left ventricle, okay? So it should be mentioned that because the atrioventricular valves are now open, the venous blood from the lungs will also pass through the atria. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're saying first it is rapid, but passive ventricular phase, the, the ventricle is filling. But now, because the atrioventricular valves have opened, eh, the venous blood from the lungs will also pass through the atria. Make, make note of that. Therefore, the, at, the, the, the atrioventricular valves now will work as a pipe or as a passage, or rather as a conduit. You can go to the next slide, Mr. David. So there was first rapid passive ventricular phase, okay? Now we're talking about this one is rapid and slow or passive if, 
uh, first rapid, there is rapid, and now we go to slow, um, slow passive ventricular filling. There is a point where we're saying first blood oozes into the left ventricle because of how it had accumulated into the atria. And because the atrioventricular valves are still open, we're going to realize that certain amounts of blood retaining from the lungs will pass through the atrioventricular valves. And at this point, the valves will basically act as a conduit. Mm -hmm. as a passage. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Basically, what I was explaining, if we are to follow um, uh, that uh, cycle is from the point of atrial contraction, like I had said, and you can simply run through um, all the phases into isovolumetric contraction, Okay, then it can guide you through until we come back. Since we're talking about a cycle, remember, so there is one contraction and there is one relaxation. That's one systole and one diastole. So we always need to make sure that we are discussing in terms of what is happening in the left atria, what is happening in the left ventricle, and subsequently in the aorta. If it's on the right, same applies. We're basically dealing with three chambers, the outflow tract, the atria and the left ventricle. So this is self-explanatory. Okay, we can go. All right, when it is relaxation time, we can see which uh, valves are open. It is still showing us the cable system. We go back, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, showing the drainage through the right heart. Same applies to the left heart when the heart is relaxing. And when the heart is, begins to contract, so the atrioventricular valves are closed and then the outflow tract are open. We can go. All right, the same explanation with these, with these images. So basically the cardiac cycle in, in its uh, simplest form that I can uh, put across has got, um, uh, basically two uh, phases, a phase of contraction and a phase of relaxation. What is being shown there now are pressure changes. And as a result of electrical currents, uh, uh, mechanical changes that happen due to the muscles contracting, the QPRIS is now what you're going to see as you do your ECG. I'm sure other people that are well versed who may come in to do either ECG, I know, my mentors that are on the platform, Mr. Cuthbert is there. So we can we can always share notes on this one as, as a group. So it is also, this is also showing us from the atrial diastole, from the time the atria is relaxing, then the atria contracts, which, which phase is the longest. So you can see that at the time that the atria is relaxing is the longest, the atria will relax for quite for quite some time or when you look at the blue relaxation there at the, at the end there. Okay, the next. All right. Uh, quickly, I don't know whether, because there is also a joint uh, presentation about one or two slides in terms of the pathologies that may affect the, the cardiac muscle. I don't know whether questions should now come in terms of the cycle. We, we just proceed. I, I beg I beg to be corrected. Probably others may want to, to add on certain things on the cycle before we move to, to, to the cardiac cycle. Mr. David. Hello, Mr. David. Mr. David. Mr. David. You can proceed, sir. Okay, okay. C can you now, proceed? Yeah. All right, all right, okay, thank you. Now, we wanted to lay a foundation in terms of what happens in, in, in terms off. of... Hello? Are you able to get me? 
Yes. Mr. Clement, uh, we can get you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Give me a slide that introduces cardiomyopathies. Now, having, all right, there. Having discussed the cardiac cycle with a background knowledge that we're talking about mechanical events that are happening, okay, in this heart that we have described with a brief anatomy that they are basically uh, two sides of the heart. There's the left heart, and the right heart. Of course, this is just a muscle myocardium, all right? And then having realized that it's got uh, two ventricular chambers and two atria, we want to establish a foundation where once we understand what is happening, the way the blood is moving, at what is happening at this stage, at which stage of the cycle. I want to introduce a topic that was already introduced the last time by Mr. Paul, thanks to him. In our practice, we may come across diseases that affect the heart muscle. Remember, we're talking about contraction here. And I did emphasize that we're talking about one systole and one diastole. That is what prompted me to add one or two slides in terms of cardiomyopathies. Because as, even as we practice our echocardiography, you realize that we're dealing with a heart muscle here. In our cardiac cycle, we want to see a heart that is contracting very well, maintaining the stroke volume, which is the cardiac output, that's number one. We also want to see a heart that is relaxing very well. Right? So it simply means that a number of diseases of the heart muscle may affect the way the heart functions in the cardiac cycle. So by definition, what are cardiomyopathies then? You realize that this is basically a group of a myocardial dysfunction. So somebody labored to introduce one uh, dysfunction, which is dilated cardiomyopathy. But we need to be very clear. Sorry, Mr. Clement. Um, I just want to ask Mr. Slavia to switch off his mic. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Okay. There's some background noise still. I want, I want us to be very clear about the cardiomyopathies. So it's a group. I think I did highlight this the last time. It's a group of uh, myocardial dysfunction. I mean, myocardial dysfunction, a group of diseases that affect the myocardium. Remember, we are saying in our cardiac cycle, we are focusing on the systole and on the diastole. So the heart contracting very well, maintaining ejection fraction, and the heart that relaxes pretty well that it is able to fill up nicely. So anything that then is going to affect the way the heart is contracting in terms of the cardiac muscle contracting or relaxing, then these are cardiomyopathies. But we should be very clear in our concept of what causes these. In our exclusion criteria, we had mentioned that high blood pressure, a change in the myocardium as a result of high blood pressure is not a cardiomyopathy, all right? Valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease, coronary heart disease, we can mention them. Mm -hmm. Any inflammation, it should not be included. It means therefore that uh, this uh, disease could be an intrinsic factor. So there were so many factors that we had highlighted when Paul had presented. I just wanted us to be very clear about what can happen. Because you may find that one patient that you may be seeing is a non-hypertensive and therefore certain changes or damages that happen to the myocardium, you expect hypertrophy in there. And then when you do your echocardiography, probably you find hypertrophy. We do not want to mistake that to be a part of cardiomyopathies. So these are in, as, or as, as a result of intrinsic factors. Mm -hmm. So there are so many factors, others are idiopathic. We may not know what is causing it, all right? We did mention that they could be as a result of alcohol, sometimes a condition of iron overload called, yeah? Yeah, where there is uh, iron going into 
um, organs causing stiffness probably in terms of um, their um, moisture, the muscle in terms of relaxation. It could be genetic and probably other drugs uh, that could have caused that. So there are basically three type of cardiomyopathies that we may discuss in our preamble and others may probably add on. So there will be dilated cardiomyopathy that Paul had labored to explain for those that were that were there as we, as we discussed. So this is a condition in which the uh, chambers of the heart become, not, not that one, you're, you're, you're not there, DCM, the first slide. The chamber balloons up. Hmm? Go back to the first slide. All right, there. Hmm? A condition in which the heart muscle becomes very weak and very thin. This should be very distinctive even as you are doing your imaging. The muscle cannot contract very well and it is thinning up. Because sometimes you may have a thickened muscle and then a dilated chamber like that. But in dilated cardiomyopathies, it's a disease of a heart muscle where there is dilatation or ballooning uh, of the left ventricle. So this ballooning causes globular impairment mm, in terms of the way the ventricle will contract. Therefore, in dilated cardiomyopathy, there is systolic failure. All right, because the ventricle cannot uh, contract very, very well. So you find that if the left ventricle is, or the ventricle is not able to contract very well, remember as we are discussing these things, we're focusing mostly on the left heart because this is our main pump, but these may also occur in, in the right heart. So of course we had discussed a number of cl clinical uh, features uh, that, uh, that you may see because cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy may end up into congestion leading to CCF, almost 90% there is by ventricular heart failure. Therefore, there is a backward pressure in, in, in terms of uh, blood going backwards to, to the either systemic circulation, the cable system, and then the lungs. Therefore, if there is bogging of the lungs, you're drowning in your own lungs, you are now going to get the pulmonary edema, a cough probably, as you are scouted, you are feeling some crepitations, all right, dyspnea, you cannot lie. I mean, orthopenia, you cannot lie on your supine. So there are all those issues that may, may come in as your clinical picture. So because the cable system, there is also back pressure. So you may find that there may be some issues to do with hepatomegaly. And then uh, ascites may come in, anasaka, which is uh, generalized edema. So I must be quick to mention that uh, since the chamber is dilated of the left ventricle, the ring of the mitral and tricuspid bow, hmm? they can be stretching there. They, it can lead to stretching. So they can be what is called the functional mitral valve regurgitation. Okay, they could be just some regard due to um, valvular heart diseases, or they could be functional regurgitation in dilated cardiomyopathy because the ring of the atrioventricular valve has been stretched. Remember, we're saying that there is ballooning of, of the left of the ventricle, sorry, and the heart uh, fails in terms of its uh, contraction. So this is there is systolic failure there. So cardiac output then is not maintained. So as we are practicing, we may encounter such a pathology, having understood our cardiac cycle, having known when blood moves from the atria into the ventricle at what time the valve closes. So it may help us even as we, as we practice. I thought it would be important that we incorporate a few issues that have to deal with the, the heart muscle contracting. So that's one part and we did labor to explain um, the DCM. The next um, cardiomyopathy in a group, this is a restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy. I think that that's the last uh, the last one you've given me. In my order should be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it's okay. So, yes, that one. Okay, good. So hypertroph hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy in other literature it can be hypertrophic but obstructive eh? cardiomyopathy. So 
hypertrophy means thickening. Therefore, we are talking about not globular this time, but localized. Mm -hmm. Localized and there is asymmetrical thickening. This is more pronounced in the intraventricular septal wall, like you can see on our diagram. Okay. So when you concentrate, there is localized hypertrophy in the intraventricular septum there. And if you look at the shape of our chamber there, it is as if it is a banana, a banana shaped the chamber. If you look at the, the, the hypertrophied septum there. On the left side, this image is showing normally how the septum is, but on the right side, you can see that bulging inside, all right? Ideally, when the ventricle is contracting, the muscle shortens, okay? So you realize that at that point of prominency in terms of hypertrophy, where there is asymmetrical hypertrophy, it is not uniform, the hypertrophy is not uniform you realize that there will be extensive bulging at that point because at the point where the ventricle contracts, the, 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 the ventricle, the muscle shortens. So it simply means then that it's going to shorten even more at that point. Now focus on where the thickening is and where we are seeing our posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, okay? Just look at the leaflet touching there, if you see on the left diagram there, our leaflets are just okay, independent, if you concentrate there. Now, if you look at where the hypertrophy is on the other side, the, the leaflet is actually touching there. This usually causes a lot of disease, a lot of death, sorry, I must mention, in young adults or more especially athletes, because at a time that the heart is vigorously contracting, you may find that the leaf leaflet will cause an obstruction to the outflow tract the, between the leaflet and the thickened septal wall. So the, 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 um, uh, the obstruction will, will cause blood not to move into the iota there. I hope uh, the image is big enough that people are able to see. All right. So this is the most cause, as I said, of uh, sudden death in, uh, in young athletes. More especially, remember at this time that the, the heart rate uh, increases when somebody is probably exercising. So this could as well result from gene genetic onset or gen genetic mutations that would cause this type of um, um, hypertrophied but obstructive uh, hyper, um, my uh, cardiomyopathy. So we move to the last one where we are talking about Restrictive, yes, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Here, there is thickening of the walls globally. It is not localized. It's not asymmetrical, okay? Due to some pathological infiltrations, all right? It could be granulomas that are in there or abnormal proteins. Some other causes are idiopathic. We may not know. Amyloids, amyloidosis, okay? Sometimes uh, post exposure to radiation, that's radiation fibrosis. Maybe there was a tumor there that was being treated, radiotherapy, or whatever. Then, for some reason, there is uh, fibrosis in the heart. And the heart now begins to fail in terms of its relaxation. That's why it's restrictive cardiomyopathy. So, there's thickening, of course, globally. But remember that we mentioned in our preamble about the cardiac cycle that the heart has got two functions there's the systolic function and the diastolic function. So in this last one, the diastole is the one that is affected because the heart cannot relax very well to fill up nicely. Mm -hmm. So the ventricular filling is reduced and the cause, some of the causes I have mentioned, but mostly the causes could be unknown. So these are the three uh, cardiomyopathies that we may encounter that I wanted us to chip in with, even as we discuss our cardiac cycle, having introduced the cardiac cycle, and of course, um, um, chipping in with the cardiomyopathies because Paul had introduced cardiomyopathies on Friday. So I thought it wise that as we begin this journey of echocardiography, then we just go back to the basics 
and then look at what the cardiac cycle is, what it entails, and then one or two of the pathologies that may affect the heart muscle in terms of its function. Next slide. Mr. David is not there, maybe he's out. Basically, that was the, the backbone of, uh, of the presentation in that we were discussing the cardiac cycle as a background to what the group intends to achieve in terms of practicing echocardiography. Having learned this, I expect other people to come on board now in terms of basic echo, the planes and whatever, and we can always, always move forward. Mr. David? Yeah, Mr. David is having a problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, I'm here, but uh, I can't, I've lost my controls. So I think the last slide. Uh, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. I think that's the one that shows the references that uh, is the, actually the end of the presentation. Yes, uh, it's a Blingham uh, physiology, book of physiology that I uh, use. Of course, this information is not mine. Then uh, Guyton, then of course, a few images of the, the, the internet. So I think that that was a brief uh, presentation about the, the cardiac cycle and some clarifications, of course, will come in as questions may come and other people may, may clarify. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think Mr. Chitumba can pick it up from here. Okay, uh, thank you, sir, for the powerful presentation. Uh, I hope everyone is trying to follow. Um, the heart is basically the lifeline of the human being. Uh, without the heart, uh, in its normal function, it certainly means there's no life. So this is a critical area that we have to follow. Um, even as we make our reports when we're doing the echo scans, it's, it's something that we don't need to mess up with. We can't mess up with the lifeline of a human being. So we all need to take the steps slow, but sure, gradually we'll get there. Uh, I, I thank you for the presentation. Uh, we, we are learning, uh, we are taking notes, uh, we are following. Uh, it might be great here, but we know that tomorrow it will be something that we can use for the betterment of our, for the management of our own patients. Uh, I don't have much, Mr. David, to say. Uh, besides just appreciating uh, the voice of an African uh, sonographer. If, if we find our own voice, uh, it means we will get there. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I, I think at this point, if there are any questions or contributions, we, we could allow for that to happen. So I think just to make it easy for my side, all you need to do is just, um, I think Cuthbert has raised their hand. So Cuthbert, you can unmute yourself and then proceed with the contribution. Thank you so much, Mr. David. Thank you so much, Mr. Clement for the wonderful presentation. <clears throat> my, my contribution is the, goes with the, what has been explained. Uh, firstly, I want to say thank you for this presentation because it, it, it forms a background of those who are practicing echo. I know there are a lot of us who are practicing echo, others are not practicing, but particularly for those who are practicing echo, it's very, very, very important. We must emphasize this point to understand the thorough anatomy and physiology of the heart. Very, very important. Secondly, we must understand the electrophysiology of the heart. Very, very important. And then I want to quickly relate the contribution that he was talking about, just to also contribute one thing that we must know that whatever he was explaining, it's, it may sound so complicated, but for you to do an echo, to do what you really have to know, one or two things. First thing first, we must know that pressure within the heart moves by pressure, pressure difference. For the pressure to move from the right left atrium to the left ventricle, there must be pressure difference, he mentioned. For those who are doing echo during diastolic function assessment, the E and the A, or rather the early phase and the atrial kick, those are the only 
waves that we pick on echo. He mentioned about the four phases, the isovolumetric, the airy rapid, the diastasis, and the atrial contraction. So when you put your pulsed wave on the mitral valves, you don't pick the four phases on echo, but you pick the E, which is the early phase, where blood flows passively from the right left atrium to the left ventricle. Mark that one. Secondly, 25% of blood remains in the left atrium. That is what we call the atrial kick. You pick that as an A. So the E and the A comes from those four phases he was talking about. Very, very important. My second contribution goes with, we really have to understand the pressure difference. For example, normal pressure within the left atrium should normally ranges from eight to 15 millimercuries. Very, very important when you're doing your echo. Secondly, the left ventricle during systole, it may range between 100 to 140. During diastole, it goes down, but the whole physiology has to be integrated in your technique. My last contribution goes to the cardiac output. Some of the things we must understand also, understand what this cardiac output is all about. Wherever you are doing your echo, understand that the cardiac output is calculated from the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. Now, why am I talking about cardiac output and stroke volume? They are inversely proportional. They affect each other. This is where you understand things like the afterload, the preload, afterload, and how do they come in? So really it's a big, big topic and we really have to dissect it. My last contribution is the, a lot of us, we are doing echo, but in my opinion, I feel for you to do an echo, you also have to be very thorough in understanding the ECG, why they complement each other. ECG may be non-specific, Echo will handle it. So electrophysiology also comes in. So it's really a big thing, but let's continue laying, laying the foundation so that we can build together. Otherwise, there's a lot of information that can be explained here. We just have to be together and help each other. But my emphasis, the take home is, let's be thorough in understanding the cardiophysiology of the heart. Otherwise, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Cuthbert, for uh, that in-depth uh, comment. And I think everyone else is taking note that uh, it's not just a matter of holding a probe and then obtaining pictures and uh, scribbling one or two lines. This is uh, something that is really serious, and we have to take that uh, initiative to learn and be fair in all that uh, we need. So uh, again, if there's anyone that wants to ask a question, you may just proceed, introduce yourself if we do not know you, and then make your comment. My name is Mr. Ikua. Yes, uh, sir. In, in Botswana. Yes, sir. Um, this is a very well-researched uh, talk that we had this evening. Um, really picked a lot, and I'm um, I'm not an echocardiographer, but uh, I think I've picked quite a bit of something in this. There's quite a bit of meat in it. I when normally I do some scans, the abdominal scans that this patient comes with uh, shortness of breath and those kind of things. But today I had one. I I. I was asked to do an abdomen, but uh, I got some interest. Sometimes my, my probe or my hand disappears into the chest sometimes, just to check on uh, pleural effusion and, and the like. And uh, this young little, uh, this young man, 16 years of age, he had a lot of uh, pericardial effusion. I, I would want to understand how uh, it comes about, uh, and normally the, the, the heart rates are very, very high of uh, such patients. 
I don't know how it happens that we have a lot of uh, pericardial effusion in uh, those kinds and how it comes about. That's what I wanted to understand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ikua. Uh, Mr. Clement, Mr. Cuthbert, there is a question there concerning pericardial effusion. Hello. I don't know whether, uh, was I clear? Maybe they didn't get the question. Uh, Mr. Clement, are you there? Cuthbert? Yes, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, could you respond to Mr. Ikuwa's question concerning pericardial effusion? Okay, his question, is it understanding the pathophysiology of pericardial effusion yes. or? Yes, okay. yes, in yes, relation I think just... To, in relation to echo or just in uh, general? Okay. Uh, it's general. It's no, general. I think just in general. Okay. Uh, maybe, I think the, uh, maybe you could put in uh, the, the angle from the perspective of the uh, cardiac, uh, uh, what do you call it? From the okay. cardiac okay. angle. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. I think uh, just to paraphrase your uh, the response to that. I think it's very key to understand where that pericardial effusion is coming. Firstly, it could be due to infection. For example, in the cases of in the cases of TB, TB, it can cause pericardial effusion. Secondly, you can also have cardiac-related pericardial effusion. And I think in your comment, you mentioned to say you don't understand how that comes about. But remember, remember the cardiac or the cardiovascular system, it's a, it's a closed circuit. And by closed circuit, I mean whatever leaves the right side of the heart, the left side of the heart must be the same volume that must come to the left side. So at times you could have a compromise. It could be due to maybe the kidneys, it could be due to the heart and fluid may find itself in a potential space. And one of the potential space, it's a pericardium. So fluid may accumulate there. So it's due to compromised cardiovascular physiology. The fluid is not moving according to how it should move. Remember fluid or rather blood moves from one point to point A due to pressure difference. So any compromise in the pressure difference, depending on where it is, blood fluid may find itself in a potential space. So for example, I'll give you a typical example. In DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy, you are likely, you are likely to have fluid within the pericardium. How is it coming about? Because the left ventricle is failing to contract. Now, if it fails to contract, it simply means the preload or rather the, the afterload. The afterload is the resistance that the left ventricle must overcome to open the, the aortic valve. I hope we are together. Now, once that is compromised, there will be stasis of blood. Blood won't be ejected. The, the cardiac output will be compromised. Now, remember, I mentioned about the cardiac output is a product of the heart rate and the stroke volume. So once you compromise the stroke volume, you are also compromising the cardiac output. So the way it is being the closed circuit, blood will seep. It will seep into the adjacent adjacent potential space. And one of the adjacent potential spaces is the pericardium. So in my opinion, not in my opinion, physiologically, physiologically, fluid may accumulate. And I should also mention here that uh, pericardial effusion, pericardial effusion or card pericardial effusion does not equal the larger, the, peri the amount of effusion in the pericardium. Hello? 
Yes, I can, yes. I can hear you. Yeah. The, the, the amount of pericardial effusion in the pericardium does not equal to cardiac tamponade. There is a tendency of uh, those of us who are practicing uh, echo to think when there is more pericardial fluid than there is cardiac tamponade. And when there is less pericardial fluid, there is, there is no cardiac tamponade. It all depends on how the pericardial space adapts to the accumulated fluid. So in a nutshell, fluid accumulation in the pericardium can come as a result of a lot of things. One of them is compromised electrophysiology. Secondly, it could be due to infection. I've had a, case, I've had a lot of cases where we've tapped a lot of pericardial effusion secondary to TB pericarditis. So for me, it comes back to the clinical history. So the physiology is basically around compromising the cardiovascular system and fluid may find itself. Things like ascites, things like pedoedema, it's all because the cardiovascular system, it's a closed circuit and once it's compromised, fluid may seep into the, into the, into the potential space. Lastly, I should also mention to you that uh, remember, let's look at uh, these blood vessels that we are talking about at cellular level. Now, by cellular level, once the pressure is compromised within the system, the blood vessels may dilate, the peripheral blood vessels may dilate, and once they dilate, they become permeable, permeable to fluid accumulation within the potential spaces. So basically, it's, 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 it's all about compromising the cardiovascular system. I think that's what okay. I, would, I would say. Others okay. may come in. <laughs> Because this, this young okay. man had, uh, can I had also one? some I can pleuro, he had some can pleuro infusion. Just wait. Mr. Ikua is still on, on the platform. Yeah, yeah. he had a uh, pleuro infusion also, uh, and it was um, unilateral. It was mostly on the left side. And uh, I think maybe from your explanation, I can get some hint where the pericardial infusion was coming from. Thank you. Okay. No, okay. Just, just, just to comment something on that one. You, you know what, what Mr. Clement was explaining. It's, it's, it's quite a complex uh, physiology that is happening. There is also one term that we may introduce: permanent capillary wedge pressure. That is another story. So when you bring in the issue mm -hmm. of pro effusion and other things it's it's quite a lot that can be explained but if you've gotten some something on that then then, then that's good because capillary wedge pressure it's also another story okay thank you thanks thank, thank you there was someone that wanted to come in you can quickly introduce yourself and then make a comment Malcondo. oh mr paul can you go yeah. ahead no, I, I really appreciate the, for the presentation and uh, some questions that are coming in. Uh, just to add on what Cuthbert has said, there are many causes of pericardial fusion, which he has established about probably on infection. Let's talk about uh, cancers or malignancies. Can lead to that. Some trauma can cause that and cause the fluid in there. Even um, cardiac aneurysm, which happens, which happens, can also cause the fluid, the pericardial effusion. So, also, it's quite important to know what type you know what? of effusion which is. That one there. is very hot. It's is not it, the time to start playing. Let go of that blanket. Let's have one. For us to, 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 to take into consideration. I like the, 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 the question that someone has raised. He was doing abdominal ultrasound, then uh, he, tried, he tried to get into the chest. When you are doing abdominal ultrasound, you need to know, you're not supposed to know, you are not really, you don't really need to know the echo. But you should have an idea to say, what are some guidance for me to recommend echo when I'm doing abdominal ultrasound? This is imaging. It's all integrating. So where are you, when how do you suspect how do you recommend um, how do you recommend echo in such a patient? 
which you, you yourself probably you cannot do because we need to give it to those who are doing. You recommend ECHO. There are some other issues that can point out to say there should be a problem in the heart. So you can easily recommend from abdominal. Look, you talked about some pressures. We talked about probably the IVC, if you suspect some chamber enlargement, the IVC, the hepatic vessels, all that can guide to, to you to say, there should be something happening in the heart and I need to recommend echo. One thing that I actually need to also to comment is beyond image acquisition. It's on integrating both 3D core and this imaging. That's actually when you, you, you can be useful and you can be helpful in the diagnosis. So I think that's what I can outline as a time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I can't see most of the people that have raised their hands. So I would say whoever can just come to the floor, introduce, and then uh, I think uh, Mr. Mbere's right, hand is up. Oh, OK. Long term. Yeah, but just before that, can Mr. Chancer please mute his mic? Mr. Chancer, your mic is on. Can you mute it, please? Thank you. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Langton. Langton Muchembere, I'm a sonographer in Zimbabwe. Um, I'm a toddler with regards to echo. I've got a question uh, about the cardiac cycle. Um, the presenter uh, explained very well in terms of the QP, ARA, and ACE, and uh, the issues of isovolumetric relaxation contraction. But I'm a bit lost, uh, step by step. <laughs> What are we saying here? We are saying uh, the arterial contraction is different from ventricular contraction, but it's one thing. What exactly is going on there? In terms of like we said, there are two, uh, like two stages, relaxation of the whole heart and uh, contraction of the whole heart. But at some point we are now saying the arterial is contracting, then the ventricle is contracting again. Sorry, I, I, I might sound a bit on the layman side, but exactly, I mean, the step-by-step -step event of the heart day. Thank you. Uh, Clement, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, I, I, I thought other people would come in that could have understood. Okay, let me come in. What? Okay, Paul. Okay. Uh, my brother. Uh, yes, sir. There's no whole heart contraction at the same time. Remember, it's giving and receiving. You can't receive and give at the same time. So when the blood comes from the lungs, it has space to lodge in the what in, in, in the atrium, in the atria. From the atria, it has to get to the ventricle. So what he meant by atria contracting first, that is when blood is moved from the atria to the, to the ventricles. He talked about the, the point that much on E and A wave, that is early feeling and late feeling or passive feeling, so to say, active or passive feeling. There is no, when the, 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 the ventricle contract, contracts, let me start from, from there probably come, coming back. When the ventricle contracts, it has emptied the blood. So it's expecting another blood to come in from the atria. Let me be specific, probably left atrium. As it relaxes, 
some pressure when the pressure uh when the, the when there's a pressure different the difference between the left atrium and the left ventricle blood will start coming in to the ventricle like a suction it's just like sucking since it's relaxing this atrium is full of blood the, the ventricle has got little, little blood then when the pressure is uh, it, when there's a pressure difference the mitral valve open then the blood will go into the left ventricle more uh, more like a suction the atrium hasn't yet contracted and that's where Cuthbert came in to say 80 percent of blood at that particular time goes into into the left vent into the ventricle left ventricle at that time when blood is going into the left ventricle the left ventricle is relaxing then amount of blood remains in the in, in the left atrium and that are supposed to be pumped now that is now the system which is the a wave which is the active now the atrium itself to contract to push the remaining blood into the left ventricle and when it contracts then that side another activity is expected because now the ventricle is full the mitral has to close the aortic the, the aortic valve has to open because it needs now to be to be pumped out so first there is atrial contraction then comes just after uh, arterial con 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 contraction, then the heart, there's relax at the same time, there's relaxation of the ventricle. When the ventricle is full, that blood is supposed to be pumped out. I will not use much of the pressures because I'll, I'll, confuse, I'll confuse you more. I just want to explain that's what you understand that at that level. Then that blood from the ventricle will need to be pumped out to the iota. So first there is at atrial co contraction, then after the atrial contraction, then it comes in left ventricular contraction. While the ventricle is contracting, the left atrium is relaxing, it's receiving blood. So they are not happening at the, at the same time. That's why even when you go to ECG, there is uh, there, there, there is P, then it comes in uh, QR, QR QRS complex. So they are not happening at the same time. Though it's a, the whole cardiac, but they, have, they are different or they are separate events within a short limited time because all those that are calculated. That's why people are emphasizing on ECG because you need to know how long how long does it take for the atria to contract and the ventricle to contract and to relax all those things that's why they come into play i think let me just end there for now thank you sir uh, okay. any other Sorry. question okay i i thank you mr paul i think uh, the more we discuss this the more we we open up it's very, very important. For me, I will still bring in the issue of pressures. If we are to understand the flow and the events of the cardiac cycle, we can't do away with the pressures. The pressure difference is very, very, very important. Very, very important. Blood cannot move. For in short, the mitral valve won't open until there is significant pressure difference between the atrium and the left ventricle. So physiologically, when he talked about some blood remains, physiologically some blood remains in the left atrium and that atrial kick, it's very important so that it contributes on the already pressure in the left ventricle. The idea is we want to achieve maximum pressures about 100 to 140 millimercuries in the left ventricle before it ejects and the mitral valve sorry the aortic valve between the systemic circulation and the left ventricle and the left ventricle outflow tract actually the left 
ventricle outflow tract, they have the same pressure within the same pressure with the left ventricle and the, the outflow tract. So that all chamber must have at least maximum pressure difference. That's when the aortic valve will open. As long as the pressures in the left ventricle outflow tract and the left ventricle are below a specified physiologic specified pressures, the aortic valve won't open because it's designed to open due to pressure difference. And uh, like Paul mentioned, you realize that these they, they happen, these are bits, so they overlap, they overlap, they overlap. So the, the, the sequence is quite, uh, quite fast. And I should also mention that that's why when they bring you a patient with arrhythmias, arrhythmias or atrial fibration, your question should come in. You find that in on an echo, the E and the A waves, they will be fusing. Okay, they will be fusing. The question you should ask yourself, why are they fusing? Because you are having ectopic, ectopic the, the cardiac cycle is, is, is it's either fast or quick, it's either fast or slow. So again, it takes you back to the SA node. Remember, so that squeezing, that squeezing, it's when you see it on echo, it's explaining something. There is something that is happening. The heart is trying to close at the same time, the atrium is closing and open. So pressure difference is key and very crucial when you are to understand what is happening there. So let's continue talking about these pressures until we understand. Lastly, somebody who's practicing uh, echo and somebody who's also practicing general abdominal ultrasound, I think they've, it's very important to realize that you tend to have an advantage because you can check what is happening up and what is happening in the abdomen. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Any other contribution or question? Hello, Mr. David. Hello, yes, Mr. Sir. David. Can we go okay, ahead? I'll, I think all the contributors in uh, whatever they are trying to say, but I have some reservations in the approach uh, in which we are tackling uh, echocardiography. I think we're supposed to be systematic in a way so that everyone is going to follow and understand. I think we're supposed to start by definition of what is echocardiography. And then when we define echocardiography, we then try to fragment uh, a start of echocardiography in terms of the anatomy of the heart, uh, the electrical conducting system of the heart and the physiology of the heart. And then we want to justify doing an echo is to assess a variation in terms of uh, the anatomy, variation in terms of the physiology, variation in terms of the, um, of the electrical conduction system of the, of, of the heart. Then we're supposed to go in and then talk about the, um, the technique in terms of um, uh, uh, scanning the heart, the, the, the windows that we use. Then we also have to, uh, to discuss in terms of the normal anatomy, how does the normal heart, the normal valve, how do they appear sonographically? Then we're also supposed to talk in terms of uh, the general uh, pathology that affects the, um, the heart. Then we, 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 we then relate uh, the anatomical, the, the structure of variations uh, sonographically. Uh, and then we, we try to marry everything then. I think we're supposed to do it stepwise. Like we come from the definition, we look at the anatomy uh, of the heart, we look, we look at the physiology of the heart, uh, we look at the electrical conduction system of the heart. Then we look in the broader context, the broader perspective of the general uh, pathology that normally affect the heart. Then we come into the, um, to the technique uh, uh, using our sonography, then the normal sonographic features uh, of, 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 of the heart, then anatomical variation and pathology. Then after, I think we can, okay, we can move towards somewhere. Was, uh, most people are still new. They don't know what you're talking about. Is they know, don't know about the, the, the pulmonary trunks. They don't know about the, 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 the valves in the heart. Or, or they, they don't know what you, the, the pericardium. Uh, they don't know about the, the, the sinatrial nodes and whatnot. So I think uh, where we are starting, we, are not, we do not build a foundation of, of echocardiography. So I, I think uh, we still need to start from the basics. Let's build the foundation uh, from the from definition of echo, uh, the essence, why do we do an echocardiography in the first place? We want to see variation. Where, where, where is the variation? 
in terms of the anatomy, anatomical variation. How do we know an abnormal anatomy? How do we know abnormal anatomy on echocardiography? So those are the things that we need to make so that everyone uh, have a, a, a picture. So I think our presenters were supposed to come from that perspective. Someone is talking about the anatomy. If we are systematic like that, someone is going to talk about the um, electrical conducting system of the heart. Someone is talking about the physiology of the heart. Someone is talking about the pathology in general of the, of the heart. Someone is talking in terms of the technique. Someone is then talking in terms of the artifacts that can actually affect uh, the scanning. Then uh, we, we marry everything. I think if we do that, uh, we are going to have a, a, a fruitful uh, discussion as we go forward. Otherwise, what you're doing is we are just rambling up or mixing up, up everything. A lot of people are going to be, to be confused because they're going to mention uh, like that other uh, presenter or someone asked the question about the um, about the 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 the, the, the physiology. How does uh, pleural effusion? What happen? What uh, pericardial effusion happen? It's, it's, it becomes so much confusing with people. They don't know uh, the pathologies of the the heart. They don't know where the pericardial is. You know. So I think we, we need an overview of everything. Then we marry everything up. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chitumba. Uh, your points have been taken note of. Um, I think on the sidelines after this, probably we have to talk with uh, about three or four people. I think just to conclude this meeting, uh, may we have, I think there was a hand by, is the hand down now? Mr. David. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yes. Um, thank you so much for for the moderation and wonderful presentation by Clement. I just wanted to ask, um, perhaps as a way of augmenting the concern raised by Mr. Chitumba, for yes, example, sir. we have talked about DCM, uh, we talked about DCM, but you know, we it's about measurement. When we are talking about dilatation or dilation of the, of the ventricle, within what measurements are we looking at it so that we can quickly go to the naming ceremony for DCM. Uh, also, it applies also to the, you know, the other side, the restrictive uh, you know, um, you know, cardiomyopathy. What are we talking about in terms of measurements so that we can come up to that logical conclusion for restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy? The same applies to the, you know, the other one, which is the hyper, you know, hypertrophic in nature. What are we looking at in terms of the size of the interventricular septum? What should be the size so that we know when it becomes pathological, we know when it's within normal limits. I think that those dimensions are very, very important so that uh, for beginners like me, we are able to relate with what is being discussed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think, let me just make a, a very quick comment here concerning the issues that have been raised right now. So I think the first thing, remember that there is a WhatsApp group that we created for, specifically for ECHO uh, that is being coordinated by Cuthbert and Augustine. So the whole idea is that we wanted the presentations for ECHO to be as the way Mr. Chitumba put it, almost like, you know, uh, a dummy's guide to performing echo, which means from the beginning to the last, you come with a, a book that is plain, you don't even know how to write, then you're taught how to write. I think that was the whole essence, but we had a few challenges here and there. And then I think last week, because Mr. Paul came in to try and rescue the situation and be able to give a presentation, we went ahead and then he did talk about, um, I think, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Then I think from that talk, then Clement came in to explain a few things. I think then an interest generated in terms of the cardiac cycle. So I think going forward, we are not likely to have any presentations that I would call higher level in which people would fail to understand. So we'll just trace our steps back to the A and Z. So we'll go back to letter A and then break it down in a very systematic manner. And like you just said, Mr. Jokoin, the thing is that, yes, for you to be able to say this is dilated, what are the parameters, what are these? But I think at this point, we, we may not be being, we may not be judicious if we begin to address those specifics. It means we are still taking this case a little bit further. So I think where we are now, let's appreciate what has been shared. 
by Clement, but then quickly retrace our steps back and start the process of breaking down echo in a very systematic manner so that all of us at the end of whether it's six months or what, we will know like we've been taken step by step and we'll be able to perform. And like, I think right now, tomorrow you go to work, you, you now get the probe and say, no, I'm checking if there's restrictive, you know, cardiomyopathy. I think that, that may be a little bit dangerous. So I hope everyone will bear with me that what has happened was not really the intention, but rather I think an outcome of circumstances that we had, but I think we really need to appreciate the time that our presenter took to be able to give us something tonight. So I thank Mr. Clement for that. And if any other contributions, please, I'm not saying I'm closing that discussion. We are still free to, to make other submissions, but everything has been taken note of and will definitely correct uh, our issues. And uh, I think Atupele's hand was up. I didn't see it. So if you can go ahead and make a comment. Uh, I think you've already made the comment. It was just about oh. the fact hello? that uh, this topic. Hello? hello. I just wanted to say that. What is it? Uh, just, hold on. Uh, just wait for the current speaker on the floor just to finish and then you quickly come in. Mr. Angosa, you come in later. Yeah, I was just going to say what you've just said that um, this topic came off uh, the fact that Paul stepped in because we couldn't do the present the uh, previous presentation, and Mr. Clement continued off that. And um, I just want to say thank you to, to him for stepping in and for Paul last week, and uh, Mr. Chitumba's. Um, comments we've taken note of that and we will do something about it that's all thank you mr ngosa gabriel mutali okay. ngosa please come in <coughs> thank you so much that's a brilliant presentation mr clement mine it's a comment now that we have led cardiac cycle i think i would recommend the next presentation should be on the a protocols or echo windows. I think that one which will help us, especially for the beginners. You know, in so many folders, I will insisted that the simplest scan you can do is echo. If you are able to do abdominal ultrasound, the echo is a very simple thing to do in the sense that the most important thing is you can understand anatomy and physiology. Then second, if you can be able to do those echo e windows, if you are able to pick the correct images, then you can do echo. Otherwise, especially in Zambia, we are very behind. Most of the peripheral hospitals or other regionals, they are unable to do the echoes. But if the, the way we have started doing it, at least it will help most of the especially these African countries will be able to do at least something. Then the second question, I want to ask Mr. Clement, how would you tell that this is functional, functional mitral valve regurgitation, sonographically? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Clement, you may go ahead. or Cuthbert, you can come in, or Mr. Paul. Okay, may probably can come in. Yes, please go ahead. What is the difference between mitral degustation and the functional mitral degustation? Mitral degustation is, is as a result of the mitral valve be having some defects or having some problems itself. Mm -hmm. Then mitral functional mitral degustation is when there's regustation due to annular dilation, which is in which the anterior and, mitral, uh, and, anterior and posterior mitral leaflets are 
very okay. So you expect, you only expect mitral, functional mitral regurgitation when there's annular dilation. And annular dilation can come to due to uh, DCM or aortic regurgitation and other. So it's only when you analyze, you say, when do you say, if the mitral valve themselves or the mitral valve leaflets are okay, then if you find that there is gestation, name it functional gestation. I think that, that's clear to me. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that. Uh, is there any question or contribution? Um. I have a contribution. Yes, your names and uh, my my piece is acting up. So who's speaking? Yes, please. This is Toira. And okay. uh, mine is a reaction to one of the comments about the overview on how we go about the topics of this um, fora. I think I've been following and from the previous um, fora that we had, I think you rightly put it that we are going to go step by step. I think some people were possibly not here. And so when I was listening to today's um, program or presentation, which is a brilliant presentation, Mr. Clement, for me, it was an overview. Um, it was a good overview and I think We'll proceed better from here. But what I didn't really appreciate, I think sometimes the way we try to put across our, let me say negative comments, let's try and appreciate the organizers of this um, program to start with. I think if we have something burning, it's also good we put our comments in a positive manner, you know, so that we don't go in negative words like we're just uh, rambling. I, didn't quite appreciate that. Uh, and like you rightly said, last week we had a problem, most of you that were on this forum saw, and Paul did well to step in, which was good, otherwise would have just walked away. And even the highlights that the presentation gave in, uh, the presenter gave in today on dilated cardiomyopathy, that is not it, there's more to it. And so it was a good highlight from last week is what presentation. So I think, your idea or your, your program is in line with whatever uh, one of the presenters was talking about already. So just to comment that as we give in certain things that we're not happy about, let's comment positively. We're trying to build um, this profession. So I think when we comment positively, even if it's something negative we're trying to, 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 to bring about, uh, it will really help the presenters. By the way, it's not easy to, to, to organize for some of these things. So let's not go in with a negative push. Even when we're not happy about something, let's try and be positive, comment about it in a positive way that does not maybe perhaps uh, hinge on anybody's, uh, you know, maybe I mean, make the presenter feel yeah, maybe I'm a sorry, bit. I'm not commenting. I'm not commenting. I'm not commenting. Okay, yeah, so that is what I wanted to say. Otherwise, I think we're on, we on course, you guys are doing great. And then also, if a presentation like this one is made and somebody makes it, asks a question, let's say from like the, the, other, the other person asked about the ab abdomen and plural effusion, we cannot stop that person and say, now we are not yet there, so you cannot ask this question. We could highlight and then tell them, uh, we're going to talk about this further or in detail when the time for plural effusion comes. So I would really appreciate if we're all positive about this. We're, I think it's the first time it's happening. So let's help each other build the profession, even when we're commenting and not to maybe make other people lose morale or anything. I think so far you guys are doing great in the coordination and in the organization of this uh, program. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much Toya for that. Um, is there any other comment before I let uh, Adupele to come in to make some announcements and then we may close the meeting? 
Okay, okay. Mr. Mlenga here. I think uh, Please, sir. <clears throat> yeah, you message, can go ahead. The message is very clear and uh, personally as as a as a sonographer I just want to reassure people that we are a team and uh, I think we've got the brains in this group to bring out what is necessary and uh, the way forward, positive way forward, which is productive. And I think uh, it's a matter of time, like people have said, they have commented, we can always plan, we've planned it. So I'm just reassuring that whatever knowledge that we have, I think we, 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 are, we are on course. Thank you, Toera, for, for, for your comments. So it's reassurance, I think, we have the able people, we will coordinate and uh, we'll dissect whatever may come along because we have brains in this group, I believe, and it, it will be done. All we need is to integrate each other and then come on board. So thank you so much. I think uh, the leaders of this group will, will take charge for the comments and the, the, the mistakes that are there. Thank you so much. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Cuthbert. I think uh, I don't see any other hand that is up and then it's uh, 10 to nine at this Mr. point. David, Mr. David. Yes. Um, there's a hand from Melda, sorry. Okay, please uh, go ahead. I, I didn't see that hand. Hello, uh, my name is Imelda McQuindy, sonographer at GPH. I'll be very quick. Um, I liked the presentation very much, very, very educative. But now my concern is, you see now from last week and this week, the presentations have been so interesting and so exciting and we're all getting so excited about ECHO. So my fear is, are we not going to forget to be presenting the other topics on other examinations? Um, are you consider are the co coordinators considering alternating echo topics with other topics? Because from the way I see it, I think if we have another presentation on echo, it will be very very nice. We'll appreciate it. But now, I fear we may forget the other examinations. Uh, thank you, Mother, for that. So I think let me just offer a bit of clarity concerning the issue of echo. Like I read, we said. We started off um, having a specific group of people that were going to undergo an online training via Zoom. The presentations being done by people that are certified to do ECHO. So we had, uh, I think if you're following us on the other WhatsApp group, I made that announcement. I think there about uh, 25 or so people that came forward. So the whole, plan is not uh, finally like I think uh, solidified, but it's in the pipeline. So these were going to be a series of meetings using this same platform, but specifically for ECHO. And they would not really be on the Thursdays like tonight. They would be held on other days and probably in a week it would happen like three or four times because it would be like a class ad administered via Zoom. Now concerning the issue of um, uh, ECHO now, eclipsing the other aspects. We, we won't let that to happen because um, I think next week we should be looking at the uh, outer sound of the skin. And then the week after we may have a gynecologist coming in. By end of the month, we're going to have Barbara from South Africa presenting again. So I think ECHO will still feature on Thursday, I mean, on some Thursdays, but not all Thursdays but we may advertise other slots on other days other than Thursdays that will be purely dedicated to ECHO so that those people that have shown interest to go on that particular path for the next six months to a year will be able to use that as their classroom. But we won't let other people, like we won't stop. If you just want to join in and listen, you'll be free to do so. But we just want to be able to deal with a small number of people that we can see whether if we pilot this thing, it may actually, you know, become something viable that probably in other countries, maybe people may replicate or we may even increase the number because we know that in terms of the echocardiographers, they are quite few. So this is just a way of trying to mitigate that uh, shortage. I hope that does answer your concern. 
Yes, it does. Thank you for the clarification, David. Mr. Okay. David. Mr. Uh, David. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Okay, can, uh, can I add something on what Imelda is just asked? Yes, uh, please. Thank, thank you for the for the question, Sister Imelda. The problem that we had is uh we are on autopilot. Uh, we just bring people who are volunteers uh, taking certain topics. So we didn't have much checkers in terms of the volunteers who said I'm going to present this and that. So by that virtue, that's when we saw it may be necessary if people who can present in other areas like you can then chip in. But by the by, uh, the, the, the idea is uh, ECHO, we have a separate group for it. We are actually supposed to have different slots for ECHO. Those are not all sonographers are interested in ECHO. So we might need to, uh, to, to, to divide the two so that the, the meetings, um, ECHO meetings, they're they not going to eat into our time uh, where we are supposed to be discussing other uh, general uh, ultrasound areas. So now the problem is we, we didn't have a work plan and it consisted in terms of the people who are going to present. But when people um, come on board, uh, we have got a diversity of topics where people are interested in, uh, in, in, in presenting, that would be fine. I think going forward, we also need to maybe have a, a, a commit uh, that sort of, uh, uh, suppose, uh, or, or give forward uh, certain topics that people can present or then people can take it from there. You know, when some autopilot people are just volunteering, someone just comes and say, I want to, to, to present the brain, I want to present the knee. It becomes so difficult to coordinate and be consistent. So in, in one week, you might find someone who's willing to present. The next week, you might not find someone who is so much willing to present. So that's the problem that we had. But going forward, we think uh, the zeal is going to grow among us so that we all volunteer, bring something, uh, then we can present on, then we get content every time. It's about content that we need to give people every time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Last. Welcome. Okay. I think we've lost Mr. David. Um, Mr. David, are you there? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can get you. Okay, so I'm just going to close the meeting because I don't know whether he's having problems with his connection. Okay, yeah, he is having problems with his connection. So I just want to thank everybody for logging in to this meeting for all the contributions. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. David as the host, Mr. Chitumba for playing co-host. And uh, for everybody, Mr. Clement for a beautiful presentation, Mr. Paul for coming in, Mr. Cuthbert Mulenga for um, adding on to the topic. And uh, as everybody has said, it's important that uh, we all have a passion for different topics that we can all like come in and probably present. And uh, if there's anybody who's interested in presenting, you can uh, forward your, the topic you want to present to either me or Mr. Chitumba. Mr. Slav, Mr. Slav your, your mic is on. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, so if there's anybody who's interested in presenting, they can get in touch with me or Mr. Chitumba or Mr. David, and uh, you can just uh, tell us which topic you want to present on. Uh, Tora, you are one of the people that uh, you sh should present, so just mark that. So if there's no other comments, I think I'll pass it on to Mr. Chitumba to close the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Otopila. Uh, uh, that was uh, that was good from you. Um, uh, let's keep the spirit. Let's keep learning this. Mr. Chitumba, are you still there? Uh, probably hey, I think he's going to. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, technology uh, did the the unthinkable. So anyway, I would like to thank everyone for making it. Uh, yes, Hello? sir. Oh, you're there. 